prayers have you prayed that God would save your children, huh? Yeah, ours are countless. Ours are countless. Well, let's, let's go this morning to the book of Acts, as Stan mentioned, to chapter 3 of Acts, Acts chapter 3. And today, I, I want us to return to the storyline of the early church. We, were, we started studying the book of Acts earlier this year. But I want us to go back to where we left off and pick up that what happened and look at what happened in those exhilarating days. It's really still an exhilarating story to read to this day. I mean, even as you read the book of Acts, even a casual attempt to imagine what it was like to be there and to witness the outpouring of God's Spirit on the day of Pentecost. That's what happened in Acts chapter 2. Just imagine what it was like to be there to watch those immediate healings taking place. I mean, that can really make the story come alive if you just get inside of it in your imagination. And so as the early church got going, the apostles and those first Christians, they were not only witnesses to Christ's saving gospel, bearing fruit in the lives of people, they were also witnesses of Christ's power to work wonders, miracles. They watched it happen. I mean, impressive discharges of, of God's power unleashed by their prayers, bringing wholeness to the lives of suffering, distressed people. They watched it happen. I mean, think about Think about those 12, the apostles. They had been with Jesus all those miles, all those times, village to village to village, city to city. They had been with him all those times. He had healed all those innumerable people. And they would watched many of those people follow Jesus and become his disciples. And so now, in the book of Acts... They're continuing the story. They're continuing the story. It's the ongoing story of Jesus Christ. It's, some of your Bibles title this book, The Acts of the Apostles. It's, some scholars have said, or just many Christians have said, really it's the story of the acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles and the first Christians. But that would be an unwieldy title, right? Um, and so they're continuing on the story of Jesus personally participating in the words and in the works that turn hearts inside out, that make people alive with the life of God. And Luke tells us, the author of the book of Acts, he tells us one of those remarkable stories that happened here in chapter 3, and it happened not long after the day of Pentecost, weeks or months. We don't know. And this story happens as Peter and John, two of the twelve apostles, as they were on their way to a prayer meeting. Their lives, think about what's going on in their lives for that to be true, for that to be happening, for them to be doing that. Their lives are still participating, still practicing the ongoing rhythms of attending the daily prayers in the Jewish temple. They're Christians. Born again, they're followers of the Jewish Messiah. And they're still participating in those rhythms of daily prayers, prayer meetings in the temple. And it happened, this story happened as they arrived at the temple for daily prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And as they were arriving, so was another man. But he was being carried, not by his own two feet, but by some friends or family members. He was being carried and he was being set down right at the entrance gate, right at the gate to beg from those who were going into the temple. As a crippled man, he had no means of earning a living. He couldn't, he couldn't uh, plow fields or tend sheep. He couldn't be a carpenter or a mason. He couldn't walk. He couldn't support himself. And so he was dependent upon the charity of other people. And so he was being carried to his daily routine of begging from those who were going into the temple to worship the Lord. 
And verse 2 says, in Acts 3 here, verse 2 says that he was lame. He was crippled from birth. He's a grown man. So he's lived a long, long life with this condition. He lived a long time without being able to do the normal activities. He never run and play. He never did get to run and play as a child. He never got to walk the fields or the paths or travel to another town. He never even had a wheelchair. Those hadn't been invented yet. So this man, crippled from birth, and in verse 3 it says, When he saw Peter and John, passers-by to him, he asked them for a handout. And so look at verse 4. This man's asking them for a handout. Maybe he has his cup out. Maybe he's jingling it with some coins inside. As I've, maybe you've seen done in downtown area or some part of town or in some other part of the world as I have seen. Maybe you have too. This man asked him for a handout. Verse 4 says, Peter directed his gaze at him. He didn't glance. He gazed. As did John. They both lock eyes on this man. And they said, look here, look here, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them. Go inside the moment. He's expecting to receive something from them. And oh, how he did. (laughs) But it was far better than he could have expected. Because verse 6 says, Peter then said to him, I have no silver or gold. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Peter says, look, I don't have a nickel to my name, but what I've got is better than money. I give you Jesus. I give you Jesus. Now listen, giving money to someone who's in need, it's one of the kindest acts of generosity that you can do, that you can make. Especially when that generosity from you is sacrificial. When you're going to have to do without something in order for them to have something. That gift lightens their load. It relieves a tangible burden that they bear, as you have done for Amanda and I. Thank you. But those of us, those of you who trust Jesus, I mean trust Him with your life, you need to know that you've got something far richer to give someone than mere money. Or even a home-cooked meal. You have Jesus Christ, the author of life, living inside of you. Think about that for a moment. That pulsating in your soul, in your veins, in your bloodstream, more than blood. There's someone living in there. You have Jesus Christ living within you. And the thing is, you can give him away without ever losing him. (laughs) Or him being diminished from you in one bit. One bit. You can give him away. So, So your pockets, they may be empty. But you know, you can reach into Jesus' pockets and give away all his riches. Don't worry, he won't ever run out. You can give away the riches of his hope. You can give away his help, his love, his sympathy. You can give away some kindness that comes from him through you to them. You can give away healing words. We sing about, in this last song, gracious words. Those are healing words. You can give away shared tears, as many of you have given to 
to me. You've given me Jesus in your tears. That's not lost on me. You can give away a sincere prayer right then, right there, or later, or before you see them again. You can give away life-giving encouragement. You can give away simple, sincere reminders of God's strong promises when someone is feeling fragile or afraid. And you can give people sincere invitations to come join you inside that space where God is pouring out His love and where He's pouring out His favor. In other words, you can invite people in to step inside the life you have in Christ so that they have life in Christ. You can bring them inside the love of Christ so that they are resting in Christ. And when you're doing those kinds of things, you are giving away the riches of Christ. In those kinds of ways, you become a means of grace. A means of grace to other people. A a, a means of channeling God's help into people's lives. Don't you want to do that with your life? Isn't that what you long for as a believer, right? I just want God to use me for somebody else's good. That they might be done good and God might get glory. Amen? So this is what we're doing here. This is the channel. You become a channel of that grace into someone else's life. You're not just looking at them for something to get for yourself. But a means of grace in their life. You become a conduit, a a, a pipeline of living water. Grace pouring out on heavy hearts. Hearts panting like a deer for help and hope. So let's give them Christ. Let's give each other Christ. In our words, in our ways, give them Christ. That's what these men are doing. Christ has the power to heal our lives, even if our lives have been crippled from birth. Amanda and I were talking the other day about Jesus being the man of sorrows. And we were wondering out loud if that just meant he had sorrows that last week when he suffered and died. Is that what it means? You know, the last few days of his life. Or or what? What does that mean? He's the man of sorrows. What does that entail as you look at Jesus' life? And I just have to think that being the man of sorrows, to to gain and to, to bear that title... It's got, to mean, it's got to mean so much more than that, that he just had sorrows from Gethsemane on. It's got to mean more than that. I mean, when he wept with Lazarus' sisters when he died, surely that shows he, he grieved real sorrow with that family real sorrow he he wasn't shedding professional tears of mourning (laughs) he felt it you know when he stood in Jerusalem and groaned out loud how he wished he would have or, or that they would have just let him gather them under his wings like a hen does her chicks he felt grief over them He wasn't just a Pharisee, self-righteous Pharisee, angry at them. I mean, surely, surely, go back, go there in your mind to those moments when he reached out his hand to touch and heal real people who were afflicted with terrible conditions. And he looked at them and touched them. People had chronic pains debilitating diseases. People who bore stigma publicly and 
shame because of, well, their contagious leprosy, for example. They lived with that every day. People lived with, when he touched people who had tormenting demons, surely Jesus didn't touch them and heal them like some kind of relationally distant, aloof person with low emotional EQ. Surely he didn't do that. Surely Jesus wasn't somewhat of a, just a gray rock, passionless, feelingless. Surely he bore their burdens with them, entered into their sorrows. Surely he wept with those who wept. Surely he felt the burdens of their hearts in his heart. Surely he entered inside their pain, feeling for them and with them their sadness, their sorrows. I mean, surely he was already being a sympathetic high priest who was moved by their weaknesses and heaviness by feeling it with them. Listen, he was a man of sorrows long before he bore his own. He comes inside our pain. And he feels what we feel with us. He is God with us, after all. Even when we can't feel him. He is with us, our Emmanuel. The one who knows what we feel and he knows what we face because he's been over every inch of this himself before us. I've thought of that these days that we're living through, our family's living through. Jesus has been over every inch of this himself and he went ahead of us He's gone before us. Just like his word says, he goes before us. He's gone before us in the pathway of suffering. And so when Peter says to this man, lying there on the ground, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk, he is saying to this man a personalized version of tell this mountain to jump into the sea. Simple faith. In the name of Jesus. He's telling this man's mountain of disability to be moved into the sea. And verse 7 says, in an instant, his feet and ankles were healed. Do you see that in verse 7? In verse 7, in an instant, immediately, he was made strong. You know, this encourages me because I believe, and I see it here in this story happening, that God can accomplish things in an instant that we can't accomplish in a lifetime of trying. He can make barren wombs to conceive. Just ask Sarah and Hannah and Elizabeth and Mary. Just four examples. And truth is, we could ask some of you in this room. You're among their company. He can make barren wombs to conceive. He can make crippled feet to dance. He can make ears to hear and blind eyes to see and he he can turn he can even turn around the fortunes of a city overnight when it took a wheelbarrow full of silver and gold coins to buy a loaf of bread he can turn around the fortunes of that city overnight like he did to the city of Samaria after those hungry lepers went out of the city and discovered the abandoned army camp of the Philistines and they were buying bread the next day for a nickel 
this man, crippled from birth, was healed in an instant. And that gives me hope, y'all. I mean, because in, in the face of terrible hopeless circumstances. That gives me hope. I need to see this story. I, I needed to read this story. I needed to study this story this week. I needed this for my heart. I needed to witness the work of God for this helpless man. His life, his life was so diminished. He was utterly dependent (laughs) on the kindness and the generosity of other people just to eat his next meal, just to make it another day. And I need to see that, and I need to see again, I need to see again that for God, nothing is impossible. I need to see that. I need to see that through Peter and John, that God was paying attention to that man. That God personally cared for that man and worked for him so surprisingly. I mean, he didn't even see it coming. (laughs) Peter and John were Christ's heart and hands to that man. That frequently overlooked man. How many times have we ignored beggars on the side of the road next to our window of our car or or walking down the street? That frequently overlooked man, Peter and John, are Jesus paying close attention to that man right then in that moment. Christ's heart, Christ's hands to him. That day was turnaround day in his life. The miracle, the miracle was so complete, it was so thorough for this man. He didn't even need physical therapy to learn how to use those new feet. No, eight weeks of this. Look at this. Verse 8. Leaping up, he stood and began to walk. That ain't it. That isn't in there. He entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and They recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate, that was the name of the gate, of the temple, asking for alms, for handouts, for charity. And they were filled with wonder. They were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Walking, leaping, dancing, twirling, praising God. I mean, he is, think of it, be this man for a minute, get inside of him. He is totally enjoying God's wonderful gift of two good feet. And he's telling God how grateful he is. He doesn't care who hears him. He's hoping everybody hears him. He is elated. He is exuberant. He is expressive in his worship. So vocal, so vibrant, so alive. He's alive to life. He's alive to God. I mean, the sun is shining and the birds are singing. The air in his around him is just electric, bristling with energy. Without an ounce of embarrassment to be so public with his joy in God. Just effusive gratitude to the Lord, just pouring out of his mouth to God for his obvious goodness, obvious goodness to him, God's goodness to him personally. And everybody noticed him. Everybody recognized him. They're they're rubbing their eyes in astonishment at him now that he's twirling and dancing and running and praising God. And, and, he's, and, and it says here in the verse here, he's throwing his arms around Peter and throwing his arms around John, ecstatic. Every, and everyone, everybody else started running too. He's the, he's the dancing leader. 
He's just start, they all start running too, and they start running toward him to see it with their own eyes. And when Peter saw he had a congregation, <laughs> he addressed the people. Verse 12. Look at it. Men of Israel, my friends, why do you wonder at this? Okay, stop right there. <laughs> you mean, Peter, you're not, a, you're not a wondering at this? <laughs> I mean, they were saying it, believing it. They, yeah, jump into the sea, mountain of disability. They believed it, and it happened. And so Peter's saying, why do you wonder at this? Why do you stare at us? Why are you looking at Peter and John, me and, and John as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? So Peter says, he's basically saying, look, now that this is taking you by complete surprise, has so caught your attention, ask yourselves the question, what, what's going on here? Ask yourselves the question, what is going on here? And don't look at John and don't look at me as if our power has done this because nobody, nobody can take the credit for that. Nobody has that kind of power in and of themselves to do that. And so Peter points them to what is going on here, to the source of the power that got unleashed that did do this obvious miracle. And without wasting a breath, he runs straight to Jesus Christ, points the people standing around and that gathered crowd squarely to Jesus as the one behind this. Watch what he says in verse 13. The God of Abraham, he's this, this personal God of ours as Jews, he's our God. This God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers... Glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over, delivered over, and denied in the presence of Pontius Pilate when he had decided he was going to release him. What are you saying? The very one Pilate called innocent. You repudiated. Verse 14. But you denied the holy and the righteous one. And you asked for a murderer, that's Barabbas, to be released and said, You asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And look at this line. Look at the way Peter puts it here, verse 15. And you killed the author of life whom then God turned around and raised from the dead. Yeah, to this we are witnesses. Here's, these are Jewish residents of Jerusalem. People who either didn't hear the Pentecost sermon or else heard it and walked away without believing it. And Peter is getting real personal with them about the way they've treated Jesus in the last few months. Pilate, Pontius Pilate, the legal ruler whom they appealed to, he said Jesus was innocent. He said, but you repudiated him. You repudiated the Holy One, the righteous one, which means that you stood squarely opposite of God on this. The God you claim to be on good terms with, as the God of your father, you claim to be on good terms with God, you, and you condemned him and asked for a murderer in his place. You killed the author of life. You said... Crucify him. And in those two words, you wrote the death 
of the author of life. And no sooner had you killed him than God raised him back to life, making it clear whose side God was on in all of this. And without wasting another syllable, Peter says this in verse 16. He says, in his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. Yes, faith. Faith. Just simple, childlike faith may in Jesus Christ made this man healed, made him whole right before your very eyes. Faith alone. God's grace cannot be achieved. A whole life, wholeness in your life cannot be achieved. That kind of grace is received by simple faith. And then Peter says, he says, I know you didn't know what you were doing when you killed Jesus. But God knew what you, God knew what you were doing. And God used it to fulfill his plans. Verse 17 says, and now brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance. As did also your rulers. But what God foretold what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that this, his Christ, would suffer, he thus fulfilled. In this way, he fulfilled it, through your ignorance and your repudiation of the one God sent you. God knew exactly what they were doing, and God sovereignly used it to fulfill his predetermined plans all along, the prophets said the Messiah would suffer and die and be killed. So, listen, what happened to Jesus was not plan B. This was the plan from the beginning. This was plan A. Plan only. <laughs> long before God laid the, the world's foundations, long before creation, He had us in mind chosen us, settled on us as the focus of his love to be made whole, to be made holy by his love. That's what God's plan was. And Jesus' suffering was the means by which he did it. Listen, it is in the breaking of God's own son that our sovereign God and loving Father binds us up and binds up all that's broken inside of us and builds up what is beautiful in His eyes, doing it through His Spirit at work in us by faith, faith alone. And so what Peter sees... And what Peter, said, what Peter now sees, his perspective-wise, and what Peter says about all this is that God was working... I need to hear this. God was working in the tragedy. Redeeming the story. That God took what was broken. In this case, Jesus. His lovely son. And from the ashes, God made something beautiful. And he did it by resurrecting his son and by redeeming us, the trusting ones. So Jesus' suffering is not for nothing. It wasn't meaningless. So why don't we just go ahead and trust him? Huh? That's what Peter's getting at here. Jesus' suffering wasn't meaningless. It was full of, loaded with meaning. You're part of that meaning. 
So why don't we go ahead and trust him? Trust him the way, or that, that the way he used what he did with Jesus for his glory, that he'll also use what he does with us for his glory and for our good. Though God slayed him, Jesus yet trusted him. Leading the way, not just for Job, but for us to turn around and do the same. He led the way. He's the pace setter. He's the pioneer of this path of suffering. So what do you do about all this? Verse 19, what does Peter say? Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord on you, he's implying here, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Peter, Peter's pleading with them here. He's pleading with them. He's inviting them. He's saying, turn around. Turn around and face God. Because you happen to have your backs to him. What you've done with Jesus so far in your life is the irrefutable evidence that you're living in the wrong direction. You are sinning against God in ways you don't even realize. And it's time to turn around and face God's face so he can wipe away your sins. And he can pour out blessings, waterfalls of refreshing blessings to refresh you by giving you the Savior he prepared for you. Namely, Jesus who died for you, his killers. Verse 22, he tells them, Moses said, quoting the Old Testament, the Lord God, this is, quoting Deuteronomy 18, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses is saying, from among your brothers. And you shall listen, listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet, talking about the Messiah Jesus, shall be destroyed from the people. Listen. Yeah, listen. Listen to every last word Jesus said. Don't miss a thing. Don't refuse to listen to a thing. Or God will refuse to include you among his people. Join God. Turn around and face God and join God. Come over to his side on this and join him in his desire to include you in his salvation work, his kingdom, in the coming restoration of all things that are coming one day. Include you in his eternity. Turn around and face God so he can remove the sins that keep you at a distance relationally from him. The sins that cut you off from him and will cut you off from his eternally redeemed people. Sins that risk your everlasting separation from him. That's what he's saying. And so in verse 26, he, he finishes this way. God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to you first to bless you. By turning every one of you around from your wickedness. So he ends his appeal 
to them and to us by saying, God sent Jesus not to condemn us for what we've done, how we've treated Jesus, how we've ignored Jesus, or how we've not trusted him. God sent Jesus to bless us, just like he did this man who got healed in the temple. And as we turn one by one from our stubborn, evil, God-ignoring ways, he pours out waterfalls of refreshing, living waters, making us alive, making us whole. What a God of grace to extend such an invitation to the killers of his son. Mm. What a God of grace. That's the invitation we get to extend to our neighbors. One by one. Invite them. Let's invite them. No matter, no matter, you can tell them no matter what you've done. I mean, goodness, if God will save people that were actively, personally involved in the crucifixion of Jesus, my goodness, then, then no matter what you've done, <laughs> turn to face God. You'll find his face. Here's what you'll find. You'll find his face to be smiling <laughs> when you turn to face him. Like this prodigal son who got up out of the pig slop and he decided to go home and he found his father running open-armed with his smile on, embracing his son. That's what you'll find. You won't find, when you turn to face God, you will not find him frowning at you, scowling with disappointment, condemnation, finding all the faults in you, feeling very critical of you. No, that's what we do with each other. We're the older brother. Always finding fault. You'll find him to be smiling when you face him. He'll be so glad you're coming to him to get the blessing from him. The blessing of knowing what it's like to love his son like you, like he does. And to be loved by his son like he is. And we get to invite them, no matter what burdens they bear. Even if they've been crippled with their burdens for their whole life. We get to tell them that Jesus has compassion flowing like a river. Hmm? I love what F.B. Meyer said. He said, the love of God toward you is like the Amazon River flowing down to water a single daisy. God knew all along that's the kind of Savior we need. <laughs> and so that's the kind of Savior he gave us in Jesus. And all we have to do, whether we're doing it for the first time or the million and first time, all we have to do is trust him with childlike faith. And then getting in on all of that, we get to give him away. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that this tender story is early in the book of Acts for us to discover to this Sunday. And I thank you that it holds for us so much invitation, such a picture, an image of your personal attention that you give to us and your heart of care, even for a, an often overlooked and ignored, crippled beggar who still is unnamed to us, but oh, not to you, that through these two apostles, you poured out a waterfall of refreshing healing and wholeness. And you did it in his life so fast, so unexpected, and his life was changed forever. And many people got to hear the gospel because this man's brokenness was met by your wholeness. 
and they watched it happen. And Father, it's not lost on me that we've all, if we've trusted your son, we've all been made whole, broken as we may still feel. We've all been made whole. And I pray that you would make our lives like shining little cities on a hill, shining forth the goodness of your grace, like an invitation to say, come, come to the light, come to this Christ, come to this Savior that God sent, the one God knew you needed. Deliver us, Lord. Deliver us from what cripples. And we look forward to the day when we will be made fully whole, body and soul, because of your strong promise and because of the power you displayed in the resurrection of Jesus. Today, Father, help us to come over onto your side and turn around and face you and find your smiling face and, and come under your wing, Lord Jesus, like a chick coming under some mama hen's wing and find rest for our souls. In Jesus' name, amen.